Hi everybody, Matt Yoakum back here again today with Pro Sound Effects, and today we're going to be talking about reverb. Reverb is a great topic to talk about because uh, we use it all the time in film and TV, uh, in post in general. Reverb is really important because it will give you a sense of the space that your characters are in, or the sound effects, uh, or music for that matter, if it's uh, diegetic. Um, reverb is also important in terms of uh, its ability to shape narrative content or the way that the story is being told. It can be used in ways to help put us in the psych uh, psychological space of a character as opposed to the physical or natural space that they're in. Um, so we're going to be talking about a couple of different ways to apply reverb today. Uh, and before we dive into the application of reverb, we need to discuss reverb on some technical levels first. So we're going to be talking about a couple different kinds of reverb, and then we're going to focus on two of them specifically because they're the most uh, utilized in post and film uh, in general. So reverb technically is the result of many sounds reflecting off of surfaces and then reaching our ears. And obviously, you know, the classic sound of reverb, you sort of hear sort of the long tail and decay of a reverberant sound, right? So that's just thousands of reflections hitting off of surfaces, bouncing around off of surfaces, and then reaching back at our ears later than the direct sound is reaching us. So that gives us both a sense of the space that we're in uh, reverb is super important in the natural world for shaping the space that we're in, right? That's what we're used to hearing sonically. And it's also uh, important for telling the distance of something. Sounds that are closer give us direct signal, if you will. So sound waves that directly reach your ear, uh, we perceive as dry and close. And then secondary and tertiary and beyond, those reflections that hit our ears all happen at later and later intervals, which creates that sort of delay effect. Uh, so the less dry signal you have and the more wet signal or, you know, the, the reflections that you hear, the further away something tends to be perceived as. Um, so that's important to understand, and we'll dive into that more in terms of application once we uh, jump into one of our, our examples that we work with today. Um, there are lots of types of reverb out there. There are plate reverbs, spring reverbs, uh, there are, and then in the digital realm there are... Um, there are linear reverbs, algorithmic reverbs, those two are used interchangeably. Uh, there are convolution reverbs, there are nonlinear reverbs. So there's lots of different types of reverbs out there, but today we're going to be focusing on two types of reverb that are used the most commonly in film. Those two are called algorithmic or linear reverbs and convolution reverbs, which I know many people have heard of and have questions about. So we're going to be covering both of those today in terms of the context of a film. So algorithmic reverbs. Algorithmic reverbs are any digital set of reverbs that give you an adjustable set of parameters that you can then manipulate or change in order to alter the physical characteristics of the reflections that you're hearing. Things like decay time, how long is our tail going to decay for, um, sometimes there's an early reflection versus a late reflection uh, uh, adjuster, so you have more early reflections versus late reflections. Remember uh, what I said earlier about direct signal versus indirect signal. Early reflections are the first and second and sometimes tertiary reflections that we hear off of surfaces, and late reflections are any of the sort of more diffuse signal that's left bouncing around the room off after the first and second reflections have reached our ears. So first and second reflections, what we call early reflections, tend to sound... Uh, sharper and more detailed it sounds closer to the dry signal, whereas a late reflection sounds more like the reverberant space and it's more diffuse, if you will. Um, some other parameters uh, might be some, some reverbs have tonal or EQ shapes built into them. Um, some of them have, uh, most reverbs have pre-delay, which means 
the the you can basically set a delay between when your dry signal starts and when the the first reflection comes back right um, that can be used a lot to simulate things that are uh, at a distance, especially outdoors, and uh, lots of other parameters. There's tons and tons of linear reverbs out there, and lots of them have all different kinds of parameters. There's different sets of parameters and things that you can adjust and play with on different digital reverbs out there. So just open up whatever your favorite one is, and then take a look at the parameters and see if you can mess around with those to hear what difference it's making. Algorithmic reverbs are used so commonly because they offer a lot of flexibility. All those parameters that we mentioned just a, just a second ago allow you to uh, create any sort of space that you could imagine very quickly by dialing in some of those parameters. So that flexibility uh, offers us great ability to help tell our story in the narrative context as well as to work quickly because those settings are fairly easy and common uh, for adjusting. So the second type of reverb we're gonna be talking about tonight are convolution reverbs. You may or may not have heard of convolution reverbs, and if you are wondering what they are, they are essentially the sonic blueprint of a space that we can use in post to then feed sounds through. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, if I'm sitting in my studio here, we could capture an impulse response of this room and then I could set that into my reverb, whichever convolution reverb I'm using, and play sound effects or dialogue through it. And it would sound like the reverb of this specific room. This specific room obviously is very dry because I have a lot of acoustic uh, absorption up around me. But you could take a reverberant space like a cathedral uh, and you could record that specific blueprint of that space and then feed sounds through it. Now the good news is we don't have to go and capture all of our own impulse responses all the time because there are many companies out there and many different convolution reverbs which offer their own packs of impulse responses. And there are also some other companies that will go and record uh, specific or special impulse responses and then sell those in libraries. Um, just in case you're wondering, the basics of recording an impulse response is there, there are a couple methods. So the first is to take a very high quality speaker and to run a sine wave sweep from all the way from 20,000 hertz all the way down to 20 hertz or, or vice versa. And you run this sine wave sweep. And then what you do is you record that file with whatever microphones that you have. You bring that back in to Pro Tools or, or any other DAW and then you reverse the phase of the sine wave. And what you have is because those two sine waves cancel out, you're only left with the imprint of the decay. And it's running the full frequency spectrum, right? So you get, you get all of that top to bottom without the actual tone in there. The other way of doing this is to record a really loud transient like either a gunshot or uh, I know I've had friends that have recorded impulse responses by popping balloons. You get a loud bang and then all you do is you just take the tail as that sound decays and then that leaves you with the impulse response file that you can then feed sounds through. The idea is you want to use a sound that's loud enough to create enough reflections that you're capturing a high fidelity uh, recording of that space. Um, so the beauty of this is that there's all kinds of spaces that have been recorded out there and you can, if you want to, you can go and record your own spaces and then feed sounds through it. And uh, a lot of times these libraries will come accompanied with like pictures of the spaces that have been recorded. So you can actually look at the spaces that your characters are in and then choose spaces, even just sometimes based off the photos. And then uh, typically convolution reverbs will allow you some amount of parameters to adjust that space uh, artificially after the fact. So a lot of them will have a decay where you can make it artificially longer or shorter. Um, a lot of them will have tone where you can adjust EQ, uh, low end and high end if the space is too bright or too dark, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so there is still some flexibility in these convolution reverb spaces and they can sound very convincing, which is very helpful for our uh, you know, post process. 
Um, some of the use cases I want to go over really quick, and then we will dive into the actual session where we'll be uh, looking at some examples of reverb, and we'll also be looking at the structure of how I've set up some of the busing so that you guys can understand um, how to effectively use that in your templates as well. So some of the use cases here, in most cases, reverb is used to create a sense of natural space to create depth in a mix. We talked about that briefly at the beginning, like the idea that you want to create uh, depth through either like distance or, you know, creating a, a more or less sense of the space around you, depending on what's going on. Um, but what that does is it tends to nicely gel everything and sort of make it sound cohesive and immersive, right? Like if everything is running through a similar reverb to some degree, it helps to create a unified sense of space that all of these sounds are taking place in, especially because not all of it is just the dialogue and production that was recorded on set. Um, so, uh, you know, doing that can help to create a cohesive, uh, sounding mix. Um, the other thing is that, uh, this effect is enhanced for sounds that are synthetic or designed. So like if you take things like UI or things that were created um, or, you know, sound design that was done purely in the box that doesn't have any really natural reverb to it, um, you can use this to help things feel more realistic. You may or may not have realized or noticed before that if you take something that was created with like a soft synth inside of a DAW, like Serum, for example, you can create these cool little UI tones, but then once you put them in your film, it almost feels like they're sitting on top of the mix. And it's not just a volume thing. You can turn the volume down, but there's like such a, such a presence or a lack of reverb that it doesn't always feel glued into the movie. So applying reverb to that sort of stuff is especially helpful, especially when it's mostly synthetic, because everything in our natural world has some amount of reverb unless you happen to be in an anechoic chamber, um, which most of real life does not take place in, nor do our films. So, uh, and then la the last thing that I mentioned briefly at the beginning that I'll mention again before we move into our sound design uh, uh, film here example um, is... Aside from making things sound realistic, reverb can be used in a narrative context to help things be more dramatic and to put us in the headspace of our character. And it helps to enhance emotion sometimes. So something that's really fun to do is, let's say um, we've got a character who is standing in a hospital. Let's say um, this is a woman who's just come to the hospital and she's gotten a phone call that her husband has... Um, you know, been diagnosed with something terrible. So the doctor comes out and announces this diagnosis. And this character, you know, let's say we've got, you know, now a close-up shot of this character. And she's standing there absorbing this news that this doctor is delivering her. And the camera's, you know, slowly moving in on her. What I would do in this example is, like, if she's breathing, or let's just say actually she's just looking dead straight into the camera and or or, you know, just off. As the camera moves into her, I might actually not only lower the volume of the doctor who's telling her uh, the diagnosis and what all of this is going to mean, uh, but I would also add some amount of reverb to it, probably more and more as the, as the doctor begins explaining, because as we move into her character, naturally, we're pushing in to focus on her emotions. And if the dialogue that the doctor is delivering isn't extremely vital to us understanding like the narrative context of what's going to happen, then we can afford to sort of, um, it's almost like zooming out on the dialogue, right? Like if you apply reverb and lower the volume to it over time, um, it creates this sort of space, almost like when you're zoning out, we're focusing on her and the fact that she's just in shock and no longer perceiving the actual words that the doctor is telling her. Um, and then, you know, let's say he says one thing that snaps her back to reality, then we could very quickly bring that, that reverb all the way back down to zero and dry him up, and boom, we've got a really cool moment of contrast that then creates uh, a cinematic moment that puts us back into her realistic world, right? So that's just one example I came up with just off the top of my head. I hope it made sense. 
Um, so I guess the next thing to do is we are going to dive into Pro Tools and uh, we will be looking at a short film by a friend of mine. His name is Ben Joyner. He directed this film called Abducted. It's a super, super fun short film. It's one of my favorites that I've worked on. Um, I'm very proud of the sound job in this movie. And we're going to take a look at the template for how I've got the reverb set up for this short film, how I do it for most of my films. Um, and then we're going to go through and look at some practical examples of how to use reverb in different ways to make our world feel immersive and uh, how to add cinematic value and storytelling value through that reverb. So uh, we will jump into it. Okay guys, so we're here inside of the Pro Tools session. Uh, one of the things I'll just say right off the bat is I did this film back in 2019. So you'll notice there are a couple differences, very minor in the template, the way it's set up. Uh, there's no folder tracks. Um, back then I used to use buses for each one of my pre-dubs, which I no longer do, just as a preference. Um, but that's okay, because, you know, the concepts all remain the same. Uh, and the reverbs are basically set up in the same way that I used to do it as well. So we're going to move forward with this, and uh, all, all the concepts and everything will be the same, even if things look slightly different. Um, so down here, one of the first things that you will notice uh, in this condensed view of all my reverbs... Uh, and when I say reverbs, I also have an LFE for each food group here, is that I do have all of these reverbs uh, split up um, by food group, basically by stem. Uh, so I have my sound effects in Foley and BGs split out, and usually our sound those three things do combine to make our sound effects stem. But I've got a set for each, uh, for each food group here. And the reason that we do that is because if we only had, let's say we only had this one set of reverbs for everything, when you do go to print stems for your client, all of the reverb would be baked into one single stem, and we don't want that. So we want each of these uh, food groups here, if I span these out a little bit, you'll notice these are going to my uh, dialogue stem, these are going to my effects stem, these are going to the Foley stem and the BG stem, which I also have set up in this template to be able to split out separately if the client needs it. Uh, so that that's important, because when I make stems, I need the reverbs to be contained within each food group, and hopefully that uh, makes sense for obvious reasons. So uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about real quick, looking at, looking at this setup... Uh, one of the things that you'll notice, and I'm sure you may have noticed in, in my previous uh, videos, if you've been looking at the template, is that my sends here are almost always consistent, right? I have one, two, three, four, and then this S uh, down here just stands for uh, sound effects here. It just It's taking the first letter, basically. But boom just is another word for LFE channel. Um, and it typically means like you're adding something extra. And if we go, I'm going to hit the end button down here my, to jump back down to the bottom. Uh, if we go down here to one of these LFE channels, I do have uh, Pro Sub uh, working on my channels here. So it is adding low-end content. I'm not going to be going over that in this video specifically, uh, but just wanted to point it out for you guys. Um, so, so anyhow, like I was saying, the, the importance of having all of these basically open all the time is that uh, I, can, I can click through, right? I've got all of my reverbs basically at my disposal for any track that I need. I don't have to go, every time I need a reverb on something, I don't have to go and set that up because that would be a huge time suck. It's easier to just have it always ready to go at your disposal in your template. Um, and then the other part about this is making sure they're always in the same order. And the reason for that is if I have automation on something, let's say I'm going to pop open uh, this reverb here. And if I control command click this fader, it's going to pull open this specific, uh, this specific automation on the, on the track. So let's say I were to uh, increase this to 7.2 or you know, any amount. And then go back to the normal track view. I just hit the minus key there. It'll bring me back to my standard track track view. If I drag this track down, the automation is going to follow it. Right? So that automation came right down with it. 
let's open it back up on this track. So the automation remained because it was longer than the actual width of the track. But if I pull one up the exact length of the track, right? Close this so I can move it, pull it down. So that automation is now gone with it because it was the exact length of that clip. I think I said track earlier, my apologies. And the automation follows. But the idea is that this automation was on the first send. So I always want the first send to be going to the same reverb every time. Because if I start putting things in different orders, right? If I had this, you know, verb two in place of this verb one, it would still carry the automation from the same slot. So this is slot A. And it doesn't care where the automation is going in terms of the signal flow. It just cares what slot is being carried over. So I could have, you know, in slot A here going to reverb three, and all of a sudden my reverb would be going to a different destination, if that makes sense. Um, so we always just want to make sure that we have parity across all of our tracks and make sure that all of the inserts are always set up in the same order. Um, the same actually, th that same concept, this is just bonus material, that same concept also applies to plugins. So, you know, in, in my dialogue chain here, I've got a specific setup of plugins. You'll notice it's the same every time. If I were to flip these around and move tracks up and down onto uh, tracks that had different order inserts, uh, you would actually lose the automation because it's not going to be able to carry automation from different plugins. Um, in this case with sends, it's just a send. It doesn't, it's, it's like, it, it's agnostic in, in terms of the fact that it doesn't know what's going where. Um, it just knows that there's automation on that lane. But with plugins, uh, it's not able to carry those parameters over from like a reverb to an EQ. So anyhow, you want to make sure that you've always got parity across your track so that you can move things around freely. Um, and that will make things much smoother and easier for you once you get into automation. So back down here real quick. Um, I am working in a surround template. The idea is that most of my uh, reverbs are actually stereo. And what I'm doing is because I'm going to a 7-1 stem, that'll bring up a panner. And the reason you'll notice that I have different pannings for different reverbs is because of the context for which they're being used. So personally, and this is just preference, you can set this up any way that you like, but personally, the way that I have it set up is that my reverbs one and two are always interior spaces. My reverb three is always an exterior space. And my reverb four and you'll see there's a 4A and a 4B. We'll talk about that in a minute. My reverb 4 is always what I call like a cinematic or an abstract reverb. Um, it's, it's a linear or an algorithmic reverb that has a very long decay. And we'll get into the specifics of that, uh, but it just great, creates a great cinematic sound. Um, the other thing that I do is that for most of these food groups between dialogue, effects, foley, and BGs, I almost always with certain exceptions have the reverbs set up the same because most of the time uh, our foley, our backgrounds, our sound effects with like in, in, uh, vertically within a, a session are going to be taking place within the same space. Um, so I always want to have the same reverbs available so that everything can blend and sound cohesive. Because if I start sending different things within the same scene to all different kinds of reverbs, then obviously you don't have as cohesive of a sound. So I want things to be the same. So just to, just to clarify on that, on Reverb Dialogue 1, I've got this car. A lot of this movie takes place inside of vehicles. Um, so automatically on Reverb 1, I just have a car. And so if I go to Sound Effects, I have that same car loaded up. And then if I go to Foley, I have that same car loaded up and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and then same thing for Reverbs 2, 3, and 4. So uh, really quickly, um, let's go through these. So this plugin that I have right here is Altiverb. Uh, this is a convolution reverb. This is just one of many convolution reverbs that are out there. This one does happen to be somewhat of an industry standard. 
Um, most people in post who are using convolution reverbs are using this. Uh, there are other convolution reverbs, like I said, this just happens to be one of the most common ones. Um, cause it's fairly easy to use. It's pretty self-explanatory and user-friendly, but one of the coolest parts about this that I mentioned earlier is that I can click on this image here and suddenly I've got lots of different cars to choose from. And so it's kind of nice to, it actually helps for memorizing the sound of things too, cause you've got a visual to go along with it. And so, um, you know, you can sort of memorize what your favorite sounds are. So you can change these here. You can just go through and audition them as your, uh, you know, as you're mixing something, maybe in preview or something, and you can hear what all of these sound like. If I go back one level, I've got all these different kinds of spaces, categories of things. So I've, there's tons of concert halls in here, which uh, we'll talk about. I actually use it, uh, the Disney concert hall for um, the third reverb on my music tracks instead of an exterior. Um, uh, we've got churches, uh, opera and theater houses, uh, and then lot, lots of other stuff. Um, outdoor stuff is, is, is great. Um, and then there's some really great stuff over here in design. Uh, they've got lots of interesting recordings of all kinds of stuff that sound uh, really great and can be used for both design and, uh, you know, post-mixing. So, you know, lots of these spaces are really useful. And like I said before, you can sort of look and see what the space of your narrative is and try to match it. And, and then you can shape that sound. So, like I mentioned before, a lot of the convolution reverbs do have parameters that you can adjust. Um, so here there's just a simple EQ and you can actually drop down these little arrows and there's more things here. Um, uh, Pre-delay, like we talked about. Uh, there's early and late reflections. Um, different convolution reverbs will have different controls, but Altiverb is a pretty well-rounded plugin. I um, mean, it shows you this cool, like a waterf uh, waterfall uh, FFT view over here as well, where you can see the, fre the frequency spectrum. Um, so uh, we I wanted to talk to you a bit about the panning of things. So this is something that's important in post. Basically, a lot of the times we're going to be trying to match the natural sound of the reverb that was recorded in production. Now, the, the thing about the reverb that's recorded in production is that 99.99% of the time when dialogue is being recorded on set, it's being recorded through a mono microphone. It's usually a shotgun microphone like the one that's sitting in front of me here that I'm speaking into. And basically what that means is that there's going to be no stereo width on that signal. It's going to be a purely mono reverb. So what I like to do on my reverbs is I like to pan them, especially uh, for my first two here specifically, uh, because remember, these are my interior uh, reverbs. And rever obviously interior spaces are going to present the most amount of natural reverb in production. So when I'm trying to match reverb in a space, I like to have them really centered up, right? It's going to default to stereo wide. But the problem is, let's say we're matching a piece of ADR. Let's, you know, we've recorded on set and then we've recorded after the fact in a really dry, you know, perfect, pristine sounding ADR studio what's going to happen then is when you insert that piece of ADR, it's going to sound much more dry than the dialogue that was in the natural space when it was recorded on set. So we're going to have to try to add a little bit of reverb to replicate, to match. And if all of a sudden, you know, you add some reverb to that and all of a sudden the reverb pops out really wide, it's going to sound unnatural and it's, and it's going to be distracting because nothing else was wide before that. So I tend to leave my reverbs pretty centered with a little bit of width. And you can run production dialogue through the reverb as, as you're going through a scene and to, to give a little bit of natural width. Um, and, it, and it still mostly stays centered. Uh, so that's why I do that. Same thing here. I have a little, this is a, my second reverb is almost always a slightly larger with a longer decay interior space. Uh, in this case, I really like the um, third floor stairs kind of has a longer decay. And my second reverb tends to be a um, sort of a larger room. Uh, it just depends on the setup. I actually think in my current template, the larger room is reverb one and the smaller room is reverb two. It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent every time. Um, down the line. 
And so uh, my third reverb here is actually a plugin called uh, Slapper 2, which is made by Cargo Cult. These are the same people that make Conformalizer, Matchbox, Banner, uh, and some other really great plugins. Uh, but this, this actually isn't necessarily... So Slapper 2 actually does have reverb functionality. That was one of the newer things that uh, Justin added over Slapper 1, so that you actually can add reverb to each of these points. But this is actually a delay unit primarily. And the thing that I love about it um, is that I took a uh, 5.0 uh, sort of exterior slap uh, that Tom Marks had created, um, and I created a 7.0 version of it for my 7.1 session, and it just sounds super great. We'll hear an example uh, with it, but I just happen to love that, uh, and because it's multi-channel, you'll notice there's no panning. It just automatically fills out the surround field. Uh, the panning is actually done here inside the plugin. We're not going to go too in-depth into this plugin because it's a whole thing on its own. Um, but I just love the sound of it. You can check it out on their website, Cargo Cult, is the name of the company. Uh, and then Fab Filter is also one of my other favorite plugin companies. This is a linear reverb. Um, this is the one that I said is my large sort of cinematic lush reverb. And what this is here, the way I've got this set up, is this is only a stereo reverb. Um, and the reason I've got two of them is what happens is I have two inputs that are the same, right? So in my A and my B, I have uh, both of them are being fed by the same input. So if I if I go up, let's say, uh, let's just pretend this is music and I, I click this open here. If, uh, if I were to increase, you know, this to Unity, it's going to be sending to both this and this at the same time because it's sending to reverb four and these are both input reverb four. And so what's happening is I am panning them differently. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm creating like a mock uh, 5.0 or a mock quad uh, reverb. And one of the other things that I'm doing on top of that, besides just panning them, is that the, the, the settings are slightly different between uh, these two these two units here. So on my front reverb, uh, it's at 3.5 seconds, which is a fairly long decay. Uh, it's set to close. So there's a bunch of unique parameters up here, but it's set to close. Um, and it's, you know, set at 100% width. And you'll see sort of the EQ curve that I have going on here. And then down here on the rear one, I actually have it a bit darker. It's the distance is set to be much further, which basically this is like the early and late reflections control, essentially. So this is much more late reflection, whereas the one in front is much more early reflection. Remember, I said the early reflections are more sort of defined, whereas the rear ones are more diffuse. Um, and then down here is the pre-delay. So you'll notice here on the front one, it's basically nothing. Uh, I could turn this to zero, it would basically sound the same. And then down here I have it at 110 milliseconds, which is quite a substantial amount of pre-delay actually. Uh, and the reason that I do this, it's slightly longer decay as well, and also um, there's a special uh, setting on here where the stereo width on this in, in the Fab Filter Pro R can go up to 120%. Uh, it's just creating extra stereo width. So what happens is a really cool effect with this reverb setup where um, when I send something through it, I have the closer, tighter, and, and with no pre-delay reverb in the front. And then 110 milliseconds later, it hits the rears and it's much wider, it's a little bit darker, and it's much more diffuse. So what happens is it actually feels like it's moving through the room a little bit. It's almost like the reverb is washing. Um, and it's, I, I call it like a blooming effect. So it, it goes from slightly more narrow and defined up front to much wider uh, and sort of huge feeling in the rear. And what that does by creating that delay in the rear and by creating the extra width, it makes the room feel physically bigger than it is, right? So the more pre-delay that you add on to something, the, the more that your brain perceives distance because that's how it works in the real world. And so you can make a space feel larger than it is by adding pre-delay um, specifically in this combination. Uh, it's just a sort of a setup that I've 
really grown to love and it's uh, one of my favorite things to use uh, as like a cinematic tool. So um, that is the essential setup. I know that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, one other thing I'll just point out really quickly is that on a lot of these uh, reverbs, I have EQ set up um, after the reverb unit. And that's because sometimes, uh, depending on the reverb you're using, uh, the the actual like EQ settings that they give you in here can be a little bit um, restrictive or hard to use. Um, and sometimes it's just faster where if I have a reverb that naturally has a lot of low end to just open up Pro-Q right after it and just filter it after the plugin. Um, so that is something I recommend doing if you want to shape sort of the uh, tonal quality of your reverb after the fact. You can just place an EQ after each one of your reverb units and that is helpful. So we're just going to look at just a couple examples of reverb uh, in this short film abducted. I'm going to pull back open the video window. So we're going to take a look at this session here. Um, we're going to look at just uh, three examples, uh, three and a half examples of uh, how reverb is being applied here in a narrative context. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of examples of exterior, uh, one of the interior, um, and then we're going to talk about music briefly. So um, we're going to get started just by looking here at uh, when our characters first pull up in their cop car, and they're going to open their doors and shut them and get out. Uh, I'm just going to actually just play this scene for you so you can hear it, and uh, we'll discuss. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, the, the thing that I want to talk about is actually about the exterior slap that you hear when they shut these doors. I'm going to play it one more time. So it's, I mean, it's pretty apparent when you can hear it there, but it'll sound even more apparent uh, once I solo these. So I've opened up um, my third send, which is my exterior, and then I'm going to hit Control, Option, Command, and click this fader. And what that's going to do is it's going to open up uh, this send, uh, so like send C, uh, the automation parameter in uh, every track in the session, because I held the Option key there. Uh, it's just a quick way to look at the automation globally. So I can, you know, you can see this third uh, reverb send here. I'm juicing a little bit uh, for this door. So I'm going to actually solo these elements and play them on their own. So you can actually hear there, it actually sounds pretty extreme. And that actually brings me to a good point, which is that when you are mixing or doing any kind of creative decision, really, you need to make sure that you're always listening uh, in the context of the full mix. So a lot of times what will happen is that we'll, we'll be listening to things sort of in a vacuum in solo, right? And so what will happen is we'll either put a lot of an effect or a little of an effect because we're judging it on how it stands alone. But then once you go to hear something in the, in the context of the full mix, suddenly it's either way too much or not enough at all. Uh, so in this case, you know, this reverb is pretty intense when it's in solo, but once you're in the context of the full mix, uh, it's not so bad. So, um, and it sounds pretty natural even. So I'm going to play this one more time. And then let's listen to it again in the full mix. Right? It's way less intense in the context of the overall mix. And that's basically because um, there's a lot of obscuring that's going on because of the music that's playing. There's ambiences going. Um, and there's, there's other reverbs that are taking place simultaneously. So once all of that is together, uh, suddenly it doesn't sound so extreme. So always make sure that you are listening to the decisions that you're making within the context of the full mix whenever you're doing that. So I'm going to hit Option minus key to bring everything uh, back to uh, normal track view. Um, so that's the external thing. You know, the, this exterior reverb, obviously, I like a lot. It makes sense because, 
you know, it's winter, which means it's cold, which means low humidity, which means uh, sound travels faster. You can see there's, um, you know, this flat face of this house in front of us and the other, pl the other houses around. So it makes sense that we'd be hearing this sort of complex slap. And especially in a surround environment, like obviously we're in stereo here, but in a surround environment, uh, those different delays that fire at slightly different times around the room really create an immersive feel. Uh, so that's my reasoning behind doing that. Um, it just creates a super immersive mix. Um, so then these cops are going to walk up to the house and they're going to speak to this lady and she's going to complain that her dog is missing. They're not going to take her too seriously and they're going to walk away. So um, I'm going to play this little scene as they walk away here. Uh, and then we're going to listen for the reverb and the dialogue of the woman as she begins to call after them. Let's go. You ain't even going to look for him, are you? Hey, I'm talking to you. I know my rights. What's your badge numbers? Hey! All right. So the, the reason that we're going to talk about this real quick is that reverb... Uh, is dependent upon the volume of the source that is creating the sound, right? So the louder something is, the more energy is going to travel to other surfaces and then have more energy to travel back. So, you know, if, if I were to stand outside in this neighborhood and we were just to be having a conversation at speaking level, you probably wouldn't hear any reflections at all, very little, if any, um, because there's simply not enough energy in, in, in volume uh, to have sound reach and then return uh, in this sort of an environment. But if we began to yell in this environment, you would certainly begin to hear reflections. Um, and that's what I'm doing here. As the woman begins to raise her voice, uh, let's see, I'm barely doing any volume automation there. Uh, you can tell in the waveform itself, she's starting to get louder, but we're gonna simulate the loudness. Um, I'm uh, control command, clicking this fader here again to bring up this automation lane, um, you can see that as she begins speaking, uh, I begin increasing the volume of the reverb. So let's uh, listen to this in solo. You ain't even gonna look for him, are you? Hey, I'm talking to you. I know my rights. What's your badge numbers? Hey! So as she increases in volume, so does the amount of reverb that we're getting back until her final yell here, at which point it's at its loudest. Um, determining the volume of reverb, I know a lot of people always have questions about, you know, what volume should this be or what volume should that be? What's the standard? This, that. The thing is, in, in most narrative contexts, there really isn't a right or a wrong answer here. It's really just about mixing to taste. Um, so in this case, you know, this amount of reverb within the context of the full mix, once she wasn't soloed, sounded good to me. Uh, and it just sounded natural, so that's what I went with. So, you know, it, it's, I know that's kind of a non-answer when a lot of you guys ask, you know, how do I know what to set my levels at um, for many different things? But it's really just about taste, and in this case, I thought this amount of reverb sounded good. So I'm going to play this one more time. You ain't even going to look for him, are you? Hey, I'm talking to you. I know my rights. What's your badge numbers? Hey! All right. So, uh, you know, those were two good examples of how to use exterior reverb to help create, you know, uh, a sense of space and, uh, you know, the surrounding environment. So next we're going to jump to uh, this scene. Our female cop that we were just with uh, is going to go on a date with this guy here. Uh, they're in a bar and she's going to get up and walk away in order to take a phone call from her mom who's just called. So I'm going to play through this scene, and then we're going to talk about the reverb that's going on here in this situation specifically. Uh, it's my mom. She's going to keep calling. She's relentless. Do you mind? I'll just be a minute. Oh, yeah. No, please. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. It's my mom. What's up? Okay, so... There's a couple, there's actually a lot of different reverbs going on here at the same time, but we're going to focus on one element specifically. Um, there's, just so you know, there's reverb going on for the source music to place it in the bar. There's music, uh, there's reverb for the walla that's in the background of the bar. Um, but I want to talk about specifically how the reverb's being used on these footsteps here. Uh, so we're going to listen to this one more time and pay attention to the reverb on the feet as she walks away. Please. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mom. What's up? All right. So 
I'm going to pop open this, oops, sorry, wrong reverb. I think I'm using reverb two here. Pop open this automation lane. So there's two things that are happening here simultaneously. I'm going to solo these feet. Okay, so that's that was the reverb sent that we were looking at right here, right? This is the amount of reverb that's going to the feet. And then the other automation lane I want to show you is the volume automation. So what's happening here is our actress is basically right beside the camera, right? So as we're sitting here listening to this conversation, we're basically um, sticking with his audio perspective because she's going to walk away and the camera's left on him. So, you know, we made the decision that the perspective here is going to be his and not hers. And that's pretty common for a scene like this. So what's going to happen is she's going to have pretty dry and present sounding feet. But as she moves further away, two things are happening. The volume is going down because obviously as she's walking away. The source of the sound is becoming quieter to create the illusion of distance. But the other thing is uh, going to be referencing back to what I discussed uh, earlier in the tutorial where we talked about how uh, the relationship between early and late reflections, how early reflections... Uh, sound, you know, more present and have more detail. And then late reflections, as something moves further away from you, you get more late reflections, less early reflections, um, and it becomes more diffuse. So I'm simulating that experience by reducing the amount of volume and increasing the amount of reverb, and it creates the illusion of her walking away. So with those two things in mind, I'm going to play it one more time. And then just to give you the idea of what this would sound like without the reverb at all, I'm just going to put this in preview mode on my uh, Pro Tools dock over here, and then I'm going to keep this reverb all the way at negative infinity. So the volume certainly does part of the job, but it's only about half of it. The reverb is really what convinces us that she's walking away within this actual space. Right? Um, I just think it sounds super natural. Um, and it's the sort of thing where it's like, you know, most people probably aren't going to notice it specifically, but it makes a huge difference in terms of the quality of the sound and the believability of the space that they're in. Again, the whole goal here is to create an immersive environment that sounds like it was recorded on set. Uh, and oftentimes that means recreating natural phenomenon such as this, since our Foley was recorded, um, you know, in a very tight space with no reverb. All right, so the last place we're going to jump to real quick, uh, we're going to talk about music here. So in this scene, uh, our guy that she uh, was on a date with is in his car here. And sorry, I lost my cursor there. There we go. Um, so he, two, a couple of things are going to be going on here with the music. So number one, um, there's going to be score going on. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, the... The woman that we were just with at the bar is going to end up in his trunk as a hostage while he's driving. So he's driving down the road. He's going to be playing some heavy metal music. Uh, and in this particular case, this source music um, in these upper tracks here, uh, I actually treated with just an audio suite uh, called Speakerphone, which had some reverb settings built in. Um, so this has already got reverb, so I'm not sending this anywhere. But this track down here, once we're in the trunk with her, I want to hear the perspective of the music coming through the trunk, right? Like he's listening to it up here, she's down here. Uh, and because we're not going to be hearing the dry source, I want to hear a lot of reflection. So my first reverb here um, is the car reverb that I showed earlier. And uh, I'm basically putting it all the way up to Unity uh, on, for this section because when we're in the trunk here, uh, it gives a really nice uh, boomy low end. There's a lot of bass in this particular impulse response uh, for this car reverb. So it gives a nice sort of round boominess that to me sounds pretty convincing like you would he be hearing the radio through the trunk. So I'm going to just play this real quick. Um, I know it's a lot to keep in mind all at once, but we've got the source music, the source music in the trunk, and then we're also going to have this pretty heavy sort of impending... Um, 
score here from the composer. Uh, you'll also notice just briefly, I'll just mention uh, on this particular track, I didn't get stems from the composer. So I am uh, up mixing this. That's the reason this is a 5-1 track, even though this is a stereo uh, clip here. Um, I'm just up mixing with uh, a Waves plugin. That is a topic for another time. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna play this scene here. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'll solo these two source pieces here. So you can hear how much more boomy uh, this is. The reason I kind of thinned out this track up here is mostly because there was already so much low end in both the car and the score that it just became already more muddy uh, than it is by having too much low end here. That's why we hear so much more uh, low end in the car. This is sort of one of those examples where like you have creative license to sort of change the rules of how things would r realistically be in order to better present the mix and the story. Um, but I just wanna play for you real quick. Again, I'm gonna go into preview uh, and then pull this down to negative infinity. And then I'm gonna um, pop this back to unity halfway through so you can hear the difference this is making. Right, so hopefully you heard that as soon as this snapped up to Unity, there's a ton more low end and just sort of roundness. Um, it kind of muddies it up actually in a nice realistic way. And then, uh, you know, this this music here is kind of a big drone. Sorry, exit preview. This music is a big drone. And because a lot of the elements in this score in particular are created in the box or synthetically, uh, I am giving a ton of reverb uh, to this Disney Hall, Unity in fact, for this particular piece of score, because especially in the surround environment, it just gives it like a really nice sort of immersive wash. Um, I'll just pull up in that uh, Disney Hall one more time so you can see it. But you know, it's like, even though these are synthetic elements, that doesn't mean they need to be absent of depth or a sense of space. So a synthesizer can sound super satisfying when being run, you know, even though a composer would probably never set up a synthesizer and record in the middle of Disney Hall. Um, and I'm sure there's some example out there of, you know, me being proven wrong and maybe that has happened. Um, it, it still lends itself nicely to giving a sense of space and depth to the music. You can hear the ring out when I hit pause. It's a fairly short decay. It's not super long, but it does give just a nice sort of wash. Um, so, you know, that pretty much concludes our talking about some examples of uh, reverb in this particular piece. Um, obviously, there's lots and lots of stuff to keep in mind when you're dealing with reverb. It, I know it can be a little bit overwhelming, but hopefully some of these examples have, uh, you know, been illuminating or clarifying for you. So guys, I just wanted to say thanks again for watching. Thank you so much to Pro Sound Effects. Please do me a favor, do them a favor, like and subscribe to their channel. Uh, leave a comment down below if you have any questions. I'll always do my best to try and get back to you guys. And please stay tuned for the next one.